American art was the creation of a colonial materialist culture. In the 1840s, it is beginning to explore new fields. Artists turn away from the portrait toward the landscape. For them, the landscape embodies every one of their fundamental beliefs in science, in natural good, and in divinity itself. And for Americans, the landscape is also nationalistic, insofar as it is the only ancient American past. So American artists are trying to find in the continent itself the kind of past which American social organization was itself too young to possess. And the basic image here is Thanatopsis, A View of Death, which is the title of a poem by William Cullen Bryant and of a painting by Asha B. Durand in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In it, men are reconciled with their death by the fact that they are going to rest with the majority of mankind in a beloved earth, which is not only their common tomb, but which also offers a transcendental release into its magnificent distances and, most of all, its great light. The architecture of this period serves that intention. It tries, like Lyndhurst by Alexander Jackson Davis, to fit in with nature and to look as if it had been there forever. It's just the opposite of the closed protective box of colonial architecture. The massing is heavier, but very irregular, so that it fits in with that of the trees around it. And the porch opens widely from it and leads you out to nature once more. It leads you, in fact, to the open pavilion of the stick-style porch with the sea shining through and beyond it. There's a continuity here with Thanatopsis, a desire to feel that you belong to the earth, and that the forms you make are faithful to those of nature. Durand wants to show us that it's from nature that we learn, it's to nature that we must give ourselves, and it's the shapes of nature that are sacred to us. In this painting, Durand really brings us into the woods, with the old birches falling in upon themselves. It's very much an eastern forest of buggy, swampy undergrowth, a tangle of second-growth timber. Durand leads us deeply into it, into its shadows, with only a little spot of light in the distance. Then, these so-called Hudson River School painters lead us westward across the continent. A painter like Albert Bierstadt seems to be reflecting the widespread national belief in its manifest destiny to rule the continent as a whole. As the painters followed the pioneers out west, they were certainly affected by the champions of a great new art, the photographers, who were out there as well, recording the vast new landscapes as well as they could with their photographic lenses. When Albert Bierstadt comes to paint this great scene of the Wind River Range in Wyoming, he has an advantage over those photographers. He's not limited to the size of the plate, but he can exercise the painter's magnificent prerogative to make it look more real than it really is by illusion. So he leads us in, has us focus deep in there across the glassy pool to the 1% of light right there in the middle. And then as he does so, our eyes are picking up, as they do in fact in nature, a whole 180 degree arc of vision as the mountains are opening around us and indeed rising up above to those magnificent peaks. He pulls us into the picture. He makes us part of it. And he does so even more in the way he has the picture exhibited. He has in front of it, in the painting itself, an encampment of Shoshone Indians going about, in his view, their everyday tasks. But as he had the picture exhibited, he had an actual encampment of Indians in front of it so that you went from the real into the illusion of the real, step by step you walked into the painting and finally you were out there in the mountains themselves in Eden. The Western movie, for example, has without question owed an enormous part of its popularity, not only to its simplistically heroic themes, but also because it gets Americans west, out there, into those great landscapes. You 
go home to your mother and your father and grow up to be strong and straight. Once again, of course, the Indian was the intruder, given short shrift in the classic cowboy films. Bierstadt paints his Indians ethnographically, at least in large part. And by the middle of the 19th century, Americans probably wanted the scientific strain to begin to dominate over the religious strain that they felt in the landscapes earlier. They wanted scientific accuracy. They wanted to travel to far places. And they wanted those places to be as they really scientifically were. The great trips of the naturalists like Humboldt and Darwin had fed such an attitude. And the great painter of it was Frederick Edwin Church. This painting, The Heart of the Andes, of 1859 was set up by Church in his studio with palm trees and special lighting effects and sound effects to encourage the spectator, as Bierstadt also tried to do, to feel that he's actually traveling to and into the place. <laughs> spectators were given rolls of paper so that they could, for example, travel down here to this little shrine, right up the path to it, or then go beyond it to that wonderful little ranch or, or village uh, beyond the pool, or so that they could travel up the river deep down into the very heart of the Andes along that narrow river, or then could climb up beyond it to the purple slopes of the mountains with the clouds just over their heads. You could hardly have a more realistic preoccupation. And that interest is created everywhere by light. That interest in light comes to dominate the most important landscape developments of the middle of the 19th century in America, even though they may not be best seen in these great operatic constructions by Church himself. I think this is the kind of place you have to come to understand American luminous painting. It's not in South America or in the vast valleys of the Rockies. It's really back home on the eastern seaboard. It has to do with not so much perhaps the grand tradition of landscape painting, but in part with a genre tradition of everyday people in workaday situations. And it's very different from those paintings of church and Bierstadt, which are out on the frontier, or in South America. This is near home, where it's quiet. And instead of manifest destiny, there's a sense of listening quietly to one's own soul in one's own place. America has several magnificent genre painters in this period before the Civil War. William Sidney Mount is the most touching of them. Mount paints black people in the most beautiful way. In this painting in Cooperstown, the woman has a noble calm. And once again, there's that landscape which is a common one. And it's all very still, reflecting that continuing American desire for the tranquil garden. The water is a mirror like James Fenimore Cooper's Lake Glimmer Glass. In this silence, this innocence, there's this monumental, magnificent black woman and this little boy whose life is being lived most fully right here in this relationship with this woman and with her common occupation of eel spearing. And Mount organizes the whole thing into a pyramid which he then breaks. And as it breaks, what we get, of course, 
is a sliding off silently to the sheen of the water. And there's an echo of that in one of the most haunting pictures of the 19th century. That's George Caleb Bingham's fur traders descending the Missouri. Only Bingham didn't call it that. He called it French trapper and his half-breed son. And that's what we see. Two human beings, one old, one young, floating in the fogs, floating in the mist, looking out at us, but all alone, in the wild, in the silence. Now that image already is the same one that Mark Twain is going to use in Huckleberry Finn. There the ages are reversed. It's much the same. It's an image of two human beings in America who are able to get away from racial difference only when they're in the wild. But when they get to the settlements, then it comes up. And remember that word, half-breed, as it was used in all those cowboy movies in America, right up into the 20th century. It's a word full of doom and contempt. But here the half-breed boy in the center doesn't know that. He's young and innocent and unknowing. But right next to him is a duck shot through the breast. And there's another American 19th century image there, a dead duck. And he, as a young half-breed, when they reach the settlements, is a dead duck, as Jim would have been, as Jim was, in Huckleberry Finn, when he finally came to the settlements and was thrown into chains. And then, next to these two human beings, in their complicated relationship to each other and to society, there was a pure animal image. Off to our left, a little black bear which they're bringing back with them from the north. And he is reflected in the water much more clearly than the others, as if he fits into the wild more completely than they. They're in an ambiguous position. And their life is only full when they're on the water. But it's frozen, too. It's timeless. It's silent. That light and silence lead us to the full sweep of luminism which combines the Hudson River School with the genre tradition. Out of that chemistry, a very evocative kind of landscape evolved. And this painting by Kensett, we're on the shore of Lake George. And just there in the shadows, so that it won't take our eye too much, is an Indian canoe. We're exactly at the point where Cooper takes us in the Deerslayer, where the new American is symbolically born and christened when he kills the Iroquois warrior who, dying, names him Hawkeye. The lake is without wind, Lake Glimmerglass, the mirror. And that, I think, is what gives luminism its power. It's dealing with the fundamental American image of the birth of the new Adam through the ancient magic of the mirror. So it needs the water, not only because it's the baptismal element, but also because as we look into the water, we are also looking into the sky, which is reflected by it. We merge with the cosmos and are reborn to the wholeness of things. A painter like Fitzhugh Lane is fundamentally a topographic artist who wants things to be clear and sharp. There's something in this that goes right back to the colonial tradition of linearity with its obsessive precision of form. The lines are smoothed out into sheets of light. 
coming out to transfuse us with a special sense of release and expansion. So these luminous paintings are not on the frontier, not in the Andes, but they're in Darien, Connecticut, like this one, by Kensett. And you have the feeling that something we've seen from the very beginning as very deeply American is intact here once again. Some of the folk architecture of the middle of the 19th century is much the same, especially that of the utopian religious group called the Shakers. All the furniture is very simple and beautifully crafted. But unlike colonial furniture, which was huge in a small space, this furniture is tiny in an expansive space. And a space which is defined by luminous white plaster and very thin wooden stripping. So that you feel in an environment which is calm, quiet, light-filled, like luminous painting in many ways. That luminous world can sometimes be almost surreal and even menacing. This painting by Martin Johnson Heed of 1859 shows black water with bright sunlight on both sides. But the water is black, even in the sun, when it's reflecting, according to our line of sight, a dark cloud beyond it. So the whole feeling is of the coming of menace. How that sail would be like a lightning conductor if you're caught under it. And how that rower is frozen as he tries to row to those strange figures with their backs to us on the shore. The whole feeling is of a menacing presence looming. And it's called the coming storm. The storm of the Civil War burst right here on Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg. And the National Park Service has turned this battlefield into what really is one of the great works of American art. Over there, 500 yards away, across the wheat fields, are all the southern guns lined up behind General Lee on Traveler. And you feel the unity of an agrarian region in arms. But over here, the monuments are different. Everyone is special to itself. Irish, Germans, regiments from Pennsylvania, New York, and all the states. You feel here the heterogeneity of the new union, the new world of immigrants, mass democracy a whole new world taking shape. But what you feel here, most of all, is the terrible butchery of this war, which culminated right here at the so-called angle, where Pickett's great and terrible charge came there directly across the fields and broke right here at this wall, where friends old friends wounded and killed each other. So savage this war was, and sometimes so noble. For example, the few Confederates who got as far as the wall were led by General Lewis Armistead. And the Union troops were commanded by his oldest friend, Winfield Scott Hancock. And Armistead got as far as the guns and laid his hand on one of them and was shot down. And as he lay dying in the arms of the Union officers who were doing their best to keep him alive, he asked for Hancock. And they told him that Hancock had just been hit. And he said something like, convey my regrets to General Hancock. Tell him, I'm very sorry. The 
The other thing you see at Gettysburg in relation to the post-Civil War is the impoverished South. Very few monuments, just the guns coming up out of the woods. Lee up there on Traveler. And then that terrible distance here, the site of Pickett's charge against those rich, those opulent Union lines. We see this in Winslow Homer's painting, Prisoners from the Front. It's a marvelous confrontation between North and South of a kind which Homer, as a war correspondent for Harper's, experienced at first hand. The Northern officer is clearly very well-meaning, well-fed, beautifully dressed, not very involved. And then there's every aspect of the Southerners. There's the absolutely intransigent officer in his short cavalry jacket, wholly unforgiving and dangerous as hell. Behind him is the old man, ragged, cunning, the old soldier who's been through a lot. But last of all is an image that was to haunt Homer later, and which he was to turn into the image of the hunter, the young killer, the post-Civil War Hawkeye. That boy, that lout of a boy who looks so innocent with his big feet, big hands, and a hat turned up in front. He's the hunter who keeps appearing in all of Homer's later work. And then after the war, the veteran in a new field is still in his old army trousers, trying to adjust, scything hay rather than men. His knapsack lies in the field beside him. It's like people after any war, after World War II or Vietnam. But it's as if for Homer, in this new world of the after war, that only children can truly be at home. Among all the scenes that Homer paints, in these first years after the war, the most moving and convincing are those of children. And it's that preoccupation with childhood which becomes ever-present in America from this time onward. It wasn't so before at all. Twain's Tom Sawyer was to set the tone in literature. Homer's snap the whip captures the visual image, the barefoot, small-town boy. But the whip snaps out with a control of space which reminds us of classical figures dancing, even though Homer's space is defined by a typically American light wood structure, the schoolhouse. We feel the softness of the hill behind the garland of figures that Homer throws out before it. Homer also painted the new resort world of the post-Civil War period, people bathing. And this painting of three women and a dog on the beach reminds us a little bit of French Impressionist paintings of the same period, in the beautiful color that runs through the sand, the incandescent light that bathes the figures, makes us think of their work. But this painting by Homer is different. There's something disquieting about it, something ominous. The figures don't really seem to have any relationship to each other. The girl in front is looking nowhere. The one in black is shrouded and turning away. And the third bends over and seems to frighten the dog as she wrings out her skirt. Now we begin to understand why Homer called this painting High Tide. Because you feel the depth of the water. Not very much, but palpable. And it's come in and it's just going out. And it's deposited these giantesses on the sand. Sea creatures, strange, ominous so that the dog starts back before a sea nymph's hair. The thing about Homer is that his mature relationship with nature, he learns in England. He goes to England, and he stays there for two years in the early 1880s. And this watercolor inside the bar derives from his two years in fishing villages in England. So that now for Homer, it becomes an image of a heroic humanity that stands in a relationship to nature as an adversary. Nature which comes rolling in in the power of the storm upon them. And that's the relationship that Homer comes to believe in all the rest of his life. It's not the old luminism where one sits quietly contemplating a quiet lake or harbor. It's men confronting, most of all, the old sea, which rolls in upon them with unappeasable power. Thoreau had felt it too on the outer beaches at Cape Cod. 
and he'd quoted the other Homer in order to describe it. Homer who wrote, hollow voice boil thalasses, the many voice roaring of the sea. Homer's most famous painting is also his most problematical. It's the Gulf Stream of 1899, and in it, he casts a black man on the deep billows of the sea. His painting of black people reminds us that William Sidney Mount and others had painted blacks with enormous sympathy and gentleness in the pre-Civil War period. Homer's painting is a little different, a little harder, maybe. There's one in the Metropolitan called Carnival, where a young black man is dressing up in fancy dress. And behind him are little children holding American flags, their faces open and full of hope. And behind them is the figure of the mother that holds the whole thing together. You get a sense in that hot, dappled, southern light. And he has a sense of the limitation of opportunity for the black in America. Only the fancy dress, still hope in the children, and power in the mother. Now here, he takes that black man and he puts him in a boat. We're reminded of Bingham, with the issue of race, but most of all, of Moby Dick, where Melville has all the brown and black races dragged down into the sea in the white man's ship, like a kind of sacrifice to the white man's ambition. The black man seems bound, an image which is certainly evocative of the issue of slavery. And below him in the sea, the sharks and the streaks of red like blood is clearly Homer trying to deal with an epic theme. He paints that sea coming at us as if it's almost going to flood out of the frame and spill the sharks among us. But the figure of the black in the diagonal and the boat back in the trough of the sea carries our eye back into the sea and holds it there. And we, the spectator, are preserved from the sea. And in the two paintings next to the Gulf Stream in the Met, the sea does seem to rise up and inundate the room. In Nor'easter, on the left, it beats against the rocks in a shower of white and purple spray. Then the undertow pulls back. It seems to go up behind the frame. But as they're hung, it seems to go behind the wall of the gallery itself and rises up on the other side behind the V of Cannon Rock in a great body of water that culminates in a roller high above our heads that's aiming at us to come forward and flood our world. And that embodiment of power, of the power of the earth, of darkness, is shared by American architecture in those decades, like the majestic frontal gable of the Watt Sherman House in Newport by Henry Hobson Richardson, which rises as a giant triangle to engulf us, like the inverted triangle of Cannon Rock. The new shingle style uses forms suggesting natures and which have a natural awesomeness to them the building expands and pulls us into its deep interior space. Homer's greatest contemporary is Thomas Aikens of Philadelphia. But unlike Homer, Aikens is interested not primarily in wild nature, but in human character in the modern city, in the 19th century city. So when he paints his friends like Max Schmidt in a single skull, he's in nature, but in the city, rowing on the calm school kill in Philadelphia. And what he wants to do here is a very traditional thing, 
like a Renaissance master. He wants to lay it out in clear, linear perspective. Then he wants to place a sculpturally solid image of mankind right in the center of an ordered world. And he wants it all still, as still as luminism. But now human beings are the major protagonists around which the landscape is formed. On the one hand, it's just people sculling. And here he has Max Schmidt sliding across the surface of the water, while behind him, a skull that's marked Aikens is being rowed beat by beat across the water. But it's not simply in that perspective. It's also frozen with a kind of subliminal composition that makes it timeless, frozen, forever. The clouds echo the bridge, and the two of them resonate off the figure of the man in the center. Certainly one reason Aiken's paintings tend to look frozen is his use of photographs, and he took many spectacular photographs himself. It's true that the photographs of Edward Mybridge, which Aiken's also used, are in one way the foundation for the idea of the motion picture, but they themselves do in fact freeze motion by giving us absolutely still sequential images of it. Aikens is trying to accomplish two great things, to be wholly real and timely, and classically permanent. Here it's a pediment again, as solidly pedimental as anything from Greece. But the figures are not defined by line and plane in clear light, but, as in Rembrandt, they're shaped by the optical modeling of light and shade by chiaroscuro. And that modeling out of darkness is precisely like the late 19th century interiors that Aikens knew. The carpets are rich, and the drapes are closed against the outside. The furniture stands massively, filling up the space and dominating the environment. The household divinities are devouring the room, and Aiken's painting is a deeply poetic evocation of its atmosphere, excavating the darkness with flecks and facets of light which flicker on the glassware and then fall upon the heads and shape them into a composition, a dark jewel glowing in the center of the deeper darkness. So out of that little picture comes enormous power, a power of light. Most of all, Aikens uses everything he has to explore the character of human beings, to describe them truly and with desperate human love. In the painting of his father, we have the same pyramidal organization giving formal stability and grandeur. But it's a pyramid which is internal, turned inside. The father's head is down. He doesn't look at us. It's his hands which are in the forward plane. And we feel that those hands are loved by Aikens. He looks at them with pitiless scrutiny for the decay of age. They are so skillful, those hands, but all blotched with time. His father's face with all the accident of aging and what the sun does to the skin over the years and then all those lines in the forehead. This beautifully aged, skillful old man is in his own world of age. We feel the desire here of the son to try to make contact with his father, 
but the impossibility of achieving it. When he painted his fiancée, Catherine, who died young, Aiken saw her as a kind of ghost, eaten up by a great animal of a chair, with a vast bookcase looming behind her. Copley's Mrs. Winthrop had the reality of her household objects. But in this portrait at Yale, it's as if after a hundred years of being shut up with her furniture, the American woman had been consumed by it and by the interior darkness. When Aikens paints his wife, he puts her in a Queen Anne chair, or perhaps a Queen Anne revival chair. We remember the way Feek used the lively curves of that chair in the lively curves of his figure. But here, Aikens uses it in just the opposite way. He takes that backward curve of the splat, and he has her lean back into it, as if she had no capacity to stand upright at all, as if she'd found her last resting place. We know that she was young when he painted her, but as he painted the portrait, he progressively aged her, and he made her thinner and thinner, until finally she looked very ill, and her eyes are dark, deeply shadowed, and her hand rests on her knee as if it were an old woman's hand, all corded and powerless. And down below her weightless figure, there's Harry, their dog, all red and warm with an animal presence on the rich turkey rug. But the top of the pyramid is that figure of exhaustion in her icy blue dress with just the one touch of coquetry in the red cotton sock. It's as if Aikens wanted to go in and lift her up weightless as she is, but is driven simply to look and record and imagine. And what he's painting is most of all his fears and the reality of the human condition. And it seems to me in that he's the greatest painter of human love and human mortality that America has ever produced. The sense of the mortality of the loved one, the possibility of loss, the aging. He has it all, and he sees it all in this loved figure of his wife. Then, like Ralph Earl, he paints the lanky American. It's Aiken's portrait of his brother-in-law, Louis Kenton, sometimes called the thinker. If the woman is worn, the American hero just seems worn out. Again, he's skinny. But the marvelous thing is that Aiken's, who has only the outline to work with because of the darkness of the suit, can make us feel the way the clothes hang on the body. And within that, the bone and skinny ripcord muscle all slumped on its skeleton in space. This person is just as real as those of Copley, but he is not one of those confident, furniture-like masses in space that Copley's were. Here, Kenton is articulated, highly suffering, a worn human being. The light, thin, vertical skeleton inside Kenton is a good deal like the skeleton inside Sullivan's skyscrapers. The ultimate palaces of that urban form, growing right up out of the American sidewalk and filling the American block, the American grid plan. He and Aikens both grow out of the reality of the American situation. The realism is reaching down into the skeleton structure, which is common to man and to skyscraper alike. Sullivan welcomed that reference to the human figure because he believed in what the 19th century called empathy. I believe in it too, which should be obvious. That is to say, whereby we experience buildings and indeed all works of art through our association of them with our own bodily stance. We stand on our two feet, we carry weight. And Sullivan once said of a building by Richardson, here is a man for you to look at who stands on two feet, stretches and stirs. And that, of course, is preeminently what the Sullivan skyscraper does. And so does Kent, standing here in our own space in his scuffed old shoes. And those shoes are, are very moving historically because at the very beginning of European realism, Baudelaire had called upon painters to make us heroic 
in our varnished boots. And here are those badly shined old shoes in which you feel the weariness of the feet inside them, walking up and down on the hard urban pavement. The skyscrapers of New York were higher than those of Sullivan. They were determined to leap into space and to point, like the church spires of colonial America. Trinity Church, near the tip of Manhattan, is a good example of the type as it was rebuilt many times on into the 19th century. This is what the New York skyscrapers want from the very beginning, the pointing tower. Cass Gilbert's great Woolworth building is that, with a wonderful tower gesturing splendidly to the river and the bay. It was then joined by other towers, leaping upward to a whole new world of urban fantasy, which has since become, despite everything, the admiration and delight of the whole world, seeming to fulfill in wonder that promise of a new freedom, a new joy, which the Statue of Liberty, a gift from France, so proudly makes as it lifts its torch above the harbor. The office building is the other side of American life from the suburban house that we've already looked at. They complement each other. Between the two of them, one of the basic patterns of American life was created. By the late 19th century, that way of life was getting very rich indeed for some people. Their pride of possession recalls colonial materialism. But now there was so much money, and pride in the symbols of position had become so exaggerated that the word society assumed a character it never really had before. The sergeants, Madame X, were not dealing with American realism at all. A critic of the time said that Sargent was turning a woman into an idol in this painting. And indeed he is. He gives her the half moon of Artemis to wear in her hair. She's seductive. She wields power through her sex. He turns her into a dangerous goddess. And in that guise, he then transfers her to the new type of the society hostess of the 19th century. And painting the hostess that way, he has her take a kind of female revenge on those men who, throughout the entire 19th century, had tried to shut her up in the house. This painting of Mr. and Mrs. Phelps Stokes was originally intended to be Mrs. Stokes and a Great Dane dog. And Sargent had a great deal of trouble painting her, finding the proper costume. And one day when she came in from tennis, he liked what he saw. And he painted her in the white duck skirt and the man's jacket and the tie. It's really a very masculine costume. And then he substituted her husband for the dog. And the husband is in the background very much a pallid shadow compared to her brilliant in the foreground. And her hand was originally intended to be on the dog's head, 
But as it turns out, it's blocking her husband's sex. So there's the sense here that Sargent is making an image of the dominant female, the hostess in the house, and the husband of late 19th century American mythology who treads softly in the house and is subservient to her. The Wyndham Sisters of 1899 is the absolute climax of all that. They're in a, an enormous room, which is dominated by a portrait not of their father, but of their mother. But most of all, it's an image of the woman, a society hostess, triumphant, dominating her environment, which is now an extension of her own grandeur. And like Copley, Sargent's people consume space. They eat it up. They take it over. But now, it's not restricted colonial space, but the vast imperial space of the late 19th century. Sargent paints them with a wonderful fluid brushstroke in a flow of white oil across the canvas. The brushstroke resembles the way that silver was treated at this period. It has a sheen and a thickness which is almost oily. It's fluid and shiny, so that silver becomes a thick liquid stream in this great piece from the Gorham Manufacturing Company, so different from the stretched surfaces of the earlier silver. So there's another kind of climax in the materialist tradition just before World War I. It's different from Aikens and Sullivan, but it too is capable of creating a powerful architectural environment of its own. Out of it comes the great classical burst of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as in this interior which is at the scale of the Wyndham sisters. It could be behind them like the portrait of their mother, this great hearth with its vestal goddesses holding up the mantle. They are victories, and out in the city they figure in some wonderfully expressive public sculpture. So in his Sherman, led by victory on Fifth Avenue, Augustus St. Gaudens embodies some of the major truths about modern America, the power, the nerves, the will. The Shaw Memorial in Boston, which is also by St. Gaudens, has another kind of truth in it. In 1863, Robert Gould Shaw, in his early 20s, raised a regiment of black troops and led them south to war. They marched exactly as they're placed here opposite the State House. They went right down Beacon Street, and the fashionable clubs, like the Somerset Club, closed their blinds when they went past because they didn't believe in the use of black troops in war. And the South had said that white officers who were caught leading black troops would be shot. When this was made by St. Gaudens in 1897, the inscription read, he gives up everything to serve the state. But when Robert Lowell wrote his great poem, Ode for the Union Dead, about this monument, he said, they give up everything to serve the state. And in fact, in the relief itself, they all move together, one common force toward their common destiny. But the grandest achievement in public sculpture and architecture of the early 20th century was the completion and enhancement of the plan for Washington by the architects of the City Beautiful Movement. In that plan for the mall, the Grant Memorial played a very important part. Grant is placed here on, on his horse as he used to direct his battles, implacable, motionless, the very embodiment of war and determination. And he is protecting the capital the way he did in war. And as in war, he's looking down the length of the mall with the whole axis of movement going from him toward the Washington Monument and beyond that to his commander-in-chief, Lincoln, in his memorial.
Classical architecture has the double quality of creating a timeless, ideal setting for human action, and at the same time of commenting upon that action through the associations which have gathered around its forms over the centuries. It is human history made palpable, and history of a special kind, public, religious, involves with grand political combinations, with sacrifice, and with myth. So Lincoln sits in majesty in a temple, like Zeus. Washington points with his obelisk to the sun. The dome floats over all. And in the presence of these forms, the political life of any age is connected with its deepest meanings across time. In our generation, those meanings have been rich and tragic. From the Kennedy funeral, which were in this classic setting those of the Gracchi dead, with the assassinated Lincoln brooding down upon them, to the mighty speech of Martin Luther King about his dream. Children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. to the mass demonstrations against Vietnam. Truly, Washington's monuments hold the conscience of America, its memory, the image of its aspiration, and its hope. In contrast to the symbolic grandeur of public architecture and the skyscraper's vertical thrust, there was by 1900 the horizontal calm of domestic architecture and the climax of the suburban tradition in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, as here in his Roby house in Chicago of 1909. Here we are in the living room of Wright's house called North Home of 1912. It's the latest period room in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And these houses by Wright are the fulfillment of the whole American realist tradition that we've been following in these programs. There's the deep hearth, like the colonial heart room where we began. There's the taut wooden frame, now become space-making and expansive. Here's the furniture, scale to the architecture and built like it like 17th century colonial furniture. And it's beautifully crafted as well. It's all another aspect of that reinterpretation of the past out of which the Metropolitan Museum itself came into being. But Wright's room has a special magic, a special scale. It turns us into giants, domestic titans looming over the fireplace and carried by the horizontal molding to unimpeded ranges of space. To spaces as quiet, linear, and full of light as those of the luminist painters, and which extend out at last to the silence and light of the natural world. So the tradition has never died. Is there some genius of the American place that sustains it? some breath of this great continent with its clear evening skies. Surely it's there in us, beyond our material concerns, but making use of them. Some love of the soul's still voice, of light and silence. 